Good evening and welcome to the 48th Legislative District Virtual Town Hall. Tonight you will be seeing and hearing from State Senator Patty Kuderer and State Representatives Vandana Slatter and Amy Wallen. We are also joined by Carrie Hurd, District Director for the United States Small Business Administration Seattle District, proudly serving most of Washington and North Idaho. Questions have been emailed in advance and will be read here, with opportunities for more questions to be asked on the Facebook stream you are currently watching. If you would like to ask a question, please post that question in the comments and a staff member will relay the question to me to be read out to the lawmakers. Before we get started, I'll open it up for some brief opening remarks from your lawmakers. First, we'll hear from Senator Kuderer. Senator Kuderer has served in the legislature since 2015 and has been a senator since 2017. She chairs the Senate Housing Stability and Affordability Committee and is the vice chair of the State Government, Tribal Relations and Elections Committee and is a member of the Law and Justice and Rules Committees. She also serves the Senate Democratic Caucus as Assistant Majority Floor Leader. Senator Kuderer. Thank you, Travis, and welcome everyone. We're so glad that you could join us. Um, this isn't how we normally do town hall meetings, but we're still under the Stay Home, Stay Healthy proclamation. And Washington is doing a fabulous job with that. And I'm extending my deep gratitude to all of you who are listening to the governor's order. Um, that's very, very critical. And, you know, for those of you who know me well, uh, you know that I am very close to my dad. And he used to say that, you know, your character isn't defined when things are easy. It's how you act when things are, are hard. And things are really hard right now for all of us. We're all weathering this COVID-19 storm together, uh, but we're certainly not all in the same boat. And I think it's with that backdrop that that I'm coming to the table to answer your concerns and your questions and really appreciate that you're taking the time tonight uh, to join us. So thank you. Thank you, Senator. Next, I'll ask Representative Vandana Slatter to share a few words. Representative Slatter is serving her third term in the House. She co-chairs the Science, Technology and Innovation Caucus and is second vice chair of the Transportation Committee. She also serves on the Innovation, Technology, and Economic Development Committee and the College and Workforce Development Committee. Representative Slatter. Thank you, Travis. I think I might be at the end of my second term, just so, <laughs> just to clarify. Uh, but um, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you so much for joining on uh, Facebook. And uh, obviously, we're in a new normal where we're having meetings this way. Uh, I just want to say that uh, thank you for if you're washing your hands and you're sheltering at home, really appreciate it and echo the remarks by Senator Kuderer, uh, because right now that's sort of the biggest weapon we have to defeat this virus and to protect our healthcare capacity, which is really important. And of course, that's particularly important because uh, of course we were ground zero for the country really with this virus. And I just extend my heartfelt um, condolences and um, love to people in our district who've experienced people who um, have family members who have been, um, who have COVID and first responders, the frontline health workers who are so brave, all the essential, um, the essential workers that are out there every day um, really supporting the community. I think it does take community. This is a huge shock to our system and it also is a huge shock to our economy. So not only are we flattening the curve for healthcare, but we're slightly flattening our economy. And a lot of the questions that we've received have um, been in regards to that. So uh, we'll do our very best, I know, to answer these questions. We care deeply, I know all three of us do, and um, just uh, really wanna say thank you for engaging and for being part of the solution. And I do believe we'll see the other side of this. So thank you so much. Look forward to answering more. Thank you. And next we'll hear from Representative Amy Wallen. Representative Wallen joined the legislature in 2019 and serves on the Civil Rights and Judici Judiciary Committee, the Consumer Protection and Business Committee, and the Finance Committee. Representative Wallen also works to promote good policy to help small businesses as a member of the Small Business Roundtable. Representative Wallen. Uh, thank you very much, Travis. I, I really want to thank my colleagues for their heartfelt remarks and add my own thanks and um, sending you love and compassion at this time. It's a time that's unprecedented. You've heard it a million times, but it's really true. Nothing like this has ever occurred in my lifetime or the lifetime of my family. Um, we're all 
doing our best to get by and are challenged in very different ways. Uh, our office is doing, our offices are all doing our best to advocate for you, to advocate. We're getting um, questions about unemployment, about small business assistance, about, um, you know, just really difficult stories about families who've been touched by COVID. Um, we're here for you. We want to go to work for you. Um, knowing that the systems are uh, overwhelmed and probably their weaknesses have been exposed, but we're here to, to advocate for you. We care about you and we thank you for spending an hour or so with us tonight on Facebook and look forward to hearing your questions and doing our very best to answer them. Thank you. And uh, Ms. Hurd, would you like to say a few words? Thank you. Um, I just want to uh, let you know how appreciative I am of the opportunity um, that your legislative leaders have offered me to be a participant in tonight's panel. Um, I come from a family of small business owners. I had my own small business for quite some time. And I know what it's like when you're trying to make a payroll and business is down, or in this case, you know, being shut down for absolutely doing nothing wrong, um, but just for the public health safety. And so as you're facing this, I wanna make sure that I communicate that we have free pro bono resources, aside from even our lending programs that are here to help you. And these resources are here for you 365 days a year normally, but we are plussing up those resources so that we can have them um, available for you. Once, once this is over, while you're trying to recover, um, and hopefully so you can be more resilient on the other side of this shutdown. Um, we do have quite a few programs um, I'm not, I'll just give you a real quick overview of just a couple of them, and then I'll let it go into Q&A, but we're kind of a, a little tugboat, very small agency at SBA that has been given a giant mission, and so think of us transforming from a mighty tugboat into an aircraft carrier, and as we have transitioned, we've built the bow of the ship, and we've built the landing strip for the aircraft, but there's a whole lot of operational um, and mechanical things underneath that are still trying to be developed as our uh, lenders are trying to deliver this program. Um, so there's a lot of questions that simply we're you know still developing the policy on. It is a treasury program as well as an SBA program. And so even in our own rulemaking, we have to consult with treasury before we can issue any policy or clarification. So the two programs that you're probably hearing the most about in the news are the Economic Injury Disaster Loan, which is where you actually apply at SBA. Um, and then we have the Paycheck Protection Program where you apply with one of our commercial lending partners. They're very different, but you can get both. You just cannot use them both for the same purpose. And they both have really different purposes. So the one that I'll just from now on through the rest of this call, I'm going to affectionately refer to as idle. And I'm going to refer to the other one for the rest of this call as the PPP. So with the idle, it's really for working capital. And rather than establishing that you want to borrow $50,000, we look at what your working capital requirements are, and then we make you an offer. There is an advance opportunity where you can receive a thousand dollar forgiveness for up to 10 employees, or a thousand dollars of forgiveness per employee, up to 10 employees, so up to 10,000. If you're a self-employed individual and you apply for this program, you will count as one employee for a ten for a thousand dollar forgiveness. Um, on the Paycheck Protection Program, the PPP program, where you go to the lender, this really is a payroll support program. This program is an, intended to keep your employees connected to you, the business. So think of it as unemployment supplemented through your business. The intent is to keep your talent, your experienced employees connected to the business so that when we do get through the other side of this, that you will not have to spend money training employees, you won't have to spend money recruiting them, and you'll recover quickly if your talent is ready to recover with you. We also have debt relief. So in that, 
it's if you're an existing SBA borrower, and that could be through one of our micro lending partners, such as Business Impact Northwest, um, Ventures, um, Snap, um, any of those partners, as well as our 7A, which is where we're the guarantor of a bus uh, of a bank's business loan, or in our King flagship program, the 504 program, which is where it's, you have actually two loans. One of them is with the C, uh, Certified Development Corporation, which is a partner that SBA regulates to do those programs. So whether it's 500 or 5 million, um, if you have an existing SBA affiliated loan, we can pay those payments for up to six months. Um, we also have, I touched on just a little bit about those business resources. Um, those are pro bono, it's the Women's Business Center, it's the Veteran Business Outreach Center, the Small Business Development Centers, which um, you have um, a person in Bellevue. Um, there's 26 or 28 across the state of Washington. They're certified business advisors, excellent. Um, and they're also doing workshops on business resiliency that are free on webinars right now that you can utilize um, to help you as you're trying to transition through um, to save cash. Um, sometimes preserving cash is almost as valuable as borrowing. Um, so with that said, I will um, just touch on this real briefly. Um, SBA is kind of like a manual transmission right now. When you're learning to drive and you're shifting and you're putting in the clutch, it's kind of clunky, it's, it's um, uh, sh stuttering. Um, but as we get better at this and we've launched our second round of the Paycheck Protection Program funds, it's getting smoother. I know that there's some things in the news about um, the system was down it, it, it was because of demand, but the actual processing of the loans has gotten much smoother. So now it's kind of like we can hold ourselves on a hill with a clutch and not even have to use the brake. Is it as good as an automatic transmission? No but we are definitely smoother than we first started this program. So thank you. And I'll leave the rest for Q and A. Thank you very much. Now we'll open it up for questions. There are a few questions that have been emailed in, but you can ask a question right now in the Facebook chat. Please post your question in the chat and a staff member will send that to us to ask your state lawmaker. So the first question that we have is from Jim. And uh, I think uh, what Jim is asking here is he wants to know, when are barber shops going to open up again? Uh, he thinks that with the appointments, masks for the barbers, and uh, a lot of sanitizing gel, the dangers of serious infection will be minimal. Uh, Representative Wallen, would you like to take that question? I would, Jim. Um, we've been getting a lot of emails from all kinds of businesses ready to open, from construction to manufacturing to warehousing. Um, I think we all miss our hairdressers. I, I know I do. Um, I really, uh, uh, the challenge is going to be pr personal protective equipment. And because we're prioritizing um, healthcare workers, nursing homes, that kind of thing, and then now grocery store workers, there may, there's, a, there's a concern that there won't be enough equipment for, um, you know, a little bit lower down on the priority list, unfortunately, is barbershops. I will say that these decisions are up to the governor and what he has been doing is um, working with the industries involved and setting out guidelines. That's what he did with residential construction. So I would really encourage you to really prepare. He's look, not looking for bullet points. He's looking for detailed plans. And my office is happy to help you draw up some detailed plans that we can send into the governor and ask for his consideration. I'm sure it's absolutely on his radar. I think he's doing the best he can to make good decisions that put public health first. I know that um, this is challenging. Uh, I hope you know that commercial uh, evictions are not allowed at this moment and that you're able to apply for the various uh, programs that are out there and your employees are able to do the same. But um, right now we're all on that, that role of advocating for the governor's office that we can open safely. So I would encourage you to prepare a detailed plan and submit it to our offices or directly to the governor's and we will um, uh, try to get you on the timeline. Thank you. Uh, the next question we have is from Bob. Uh, Bob has a question about contact tracing. Um, 
He asks, is or will Washington State be using contact tracing to better understand the COVID-19 virus? I am someone with no experience with this, but I'm willing to help if needed. Representative Slider, would you like to take that question? Thank you, Travis. Sure. Um, so contact tracing is something, uh, we definitely want epidemiologic data, we want scientific data. The governor has been really good at using what information we can collect in a scientific manner, in a sort of a, a, a well-researched, robust manner to make decisions. And he's really been stressing that. Uh, one of the things that he's been talking about right now is contact tracing as being part of the next phase for sort of trying to slowly um, open the, reopen the economy, but also try to keep the coronavirus in check because we've done a good job at sheltering in place. And essentially public health has always been really good at contact tracing. Uh, they've been able to, um, if there's an outbreak, they find the person who's positive and then they look to see who they have, um, uh, who, who they've been in touch with in a previous period of time and try to get to those people to quarantine them. So to sort of hold an outbreak from getting bigger. And people have used that historically um, for AIDS, for tuberculosis, for other types of viruses. And, and, and we were the first to use it in our state when that happened for COVID. The thing is, is that it's not necessarily um, something that's always been used to reopen a state economy. So we will be using that to actually try to reopen our economy. And the governor's talking about um, um, building this sort of army, public health army of contact tracers that can go out when there's a positive case to find out who has that person been in contact with and, and speak to those people, let them know that they've been in contact with the person and what they can do to um, prevent further transmission. Uh, that is, uh, it's, it's a little bit of a new uh, area, but it, it's a really important and it's something that experts are saying we're going to need to do to keep this virus in check and to keep moving on to different phases. So in, in to answer your, the question a little bit more specifically, so obviously that's going to be really good data and information to have. The bottom line for contact tracing though is that you must have testing. And right now we are really struggling with making sure we have the right testing supplies. So the swabs and the reagents and access to those tests are, are slowly growing, I, I hear, but it's not really um, at the point where we would be able to have as, as robust, um, robust a contact tracing effort that we would want. And that is going to be very important uh, to your question as to the data, right? Because we're going to need to understand who's positive and we're going to need to understand the efficacy of those tests as well. And of course, there's a whole conversation around false positives and all of those types of things which do happen with these types of tests. I hope that's helpful. Sure it is. There's actually, there's actually a really good um, NPR, um, there's an NPR article on, on this issue. And so um, I can always send that to you, Travis, if you want to add it to, to the list or your, you know, just to let people know they can search on contact tracing. Great, thank you. Uh, the uh, next question we have is from Layla. Um, Layla asks, this is about uh, masks. Will the governor mandate face masks this seems like a very simple way we can help contain the spread of the virus. Uh, uh, Senator Kuderer, would you like to take that question? Sure, thank you. And thank you for the question. Um, uh, just wanna add just one little thing to Representative Slatter's uh, response, and that is that um, the Department of Health is looking for 1,500 contact tracers. That's the, the team that they need to put in place, but we have about 800, and so they're looking, they may need seven, 800 more. Um, and if you fall into that category where you could be hired, I think, you know, your best, this is going to be spread out over the state. So your best bet would be to um, contact uh, the Department of Health and kind of see what opportunities are there. Um, masks. Well, the governor has been very clear. Um, I think that, um, you know, his very aggressive approach to this illness out of the gate has saved a lot of lives. And he's been very clear that he would like to see us voluntarily follow these orders to the best um, of our ability. And if we do that, we're going to see the curve go the way we want it to go. Representative Slatter is right, we plateaued. We haven't um, you know, brought it down to where we need to. Uh, but if we continue to voluntarily um, comply 
uh, I think that we're going to see it go and continue to go in the right direction. He has not issued a mandatory go out in public with a mask on. He has certainly recommended that. Uh, I know today I was at the grocery store and uh, I was wearing my mask and virtually everybody else in there was also wearing a mask. So the empirical evidence that I'm seeing out there is that people are complying with that request by the governor. He did say that if, you know, if the numbers don't go in the direction we need them to go, if he needs to be even more aggressive and actually mandate something like that, um, that he will do that if he has to, to protect Washingtonians. So my hope is that we're going to continue acting like we have with the Stay Home, Stay Healthy proclamation, um, understanding the seriousness of this and that we're all in it together and, and the choices that we make do affect other community members uh, that we live with and that we come in contact with and could have some very negative consequences if we don't take these precautions. And, um, and my hope is that we won't need to get to uh, a mandate. Great, thank you. Uh, we have another question that has come in. This is from Jerry. Uh, Jerry asks, why can't new residential construction start? What is it that Washington knows of increased risk that 47 states know, don't know, including Oregon and California? Why are they wrong and why is Washington right? And uh, uh, Representative Wallen, did you want to take that or? Yeah, as, as um, my understanding that residential construction is open and that was done in consultation with labor, with the builders, the governor came together, they put out, just as I was discussing with the barbershops guidelines around what, how they felt they could operate safely, you know, people not arriving in the same vehicle, masks, personal protective equipment, social distancing. Um, I think all of those guidelines are out on the covidwa.gov website. So I, I think it's just a matter of, we are reopening the economy sector by sector. And what I'm, I'm encouraging our businesses to do is instead of waiting for the governor to um, advise how they should reopen, that they prepare a detailed plan on how they think they can see, safely reopen. And that's kind of what the residential construction industry did. Great. Uh, okay, well, we have another question here. This one is from John. And uh, Carrie, this one might be for you. Uh, John says that the PPP is great, um, but uh, Let's see, but if it is not extended at least 16 weeks to use it, special event businesses like caterers, venues, conference centers, wedding planners, et cetera, won't have enough business to use it within the eight week deadline. Is there anything being done to increase the amount of time for businesses like ours to use the PPP loan? And it looks like we actually lost Carrie. So I tell you what, we'll, we'll, we'll put that one on hold. And I have another one here that I think- uh, I think I can- I, did, I, I have I hope Carrie comes back, but I will say that we have been advocating with our congressional representatives for that to happen. We're, hi, John. I mean, we've talked a lot. We know, we all know John. Um, we, we are actively advocating and we're discussing that exact issue with our congressional representatives this week. So we are doing our very best. Great, and if, uh, if, Carrie, if we get Carrie back, we can, we, can, we can go back and circle back to that question. Uh, let's see, next question we have here is actually a question on housing, and this is from Jan. Uh, Jan would like to know, uh, that uh, asks, I heard Governor Inslee is enacting a freeze on rents, uh, but their manager has sent them uh, a letter saying that their rent will increase by $125 on May 1st. Uh, Jan is 80 years old and closed their business last year and is also a caretaker for their 44-year-old son who is blind and has epilepsy. Uh, Jan wants to know, is a rent freeze for real and for how long will it last? And uh, Senator Cooter, would you like to take that question? Sure, and um, Jan, thank you for the question. And I'm sorry to hear about um, the increase in your rent during this time. It's a tough time for all of us. Um, it is not allowed right now under the most recent proclamation. Uh, I can tell you exactly what the 
but the governor's proclamation said that increasing or threatening to increase the rate of rent or the amount of any deposit for any dwelling or parcel of land occupied as a dwelling is not allowed under the proclamation and that lasts through June 4th. Now, we have been uh, working uh, very diligently uh, collaboratively with the house and, and this includes uh, folks on both sides of the aisle on housing issues and what happens when the moratorium uh, on evictions and rent increases and that sort of thing is lifted. And uh, we are putting lots of, of energy and time into that. And quite frankly, uh, we are looking at all options at this moment to see what is the best path forward for, for Washington. We do appreciate that not every uh, landlord is in the same boat, just like not every renter is in the same boat. Some renters are still getting paid. They normally work from home and they haven't missed a paycheck and they can pay the rent and they should pay the rent. In, the, in fact, in the last proclamation, the governor made a point of, of saying that, uh, that if you can pay the rent, you should. But if you can't because you were affected by COVID-19 and you lost your job, um, that we're going to, to, we're looking for resources to help with that. And that is going to be in partnership with our uh, federal partner, uh, the federal government. And um, just know that we're still continuing to work on that and there'll be more to come. And um, I would encourage you to send your um, concern also to the attorney general. The attorney general is uh, taking complaints for any violations of the governor's proclamation during this time and he is aggressively pursuing those. Uh, so if you haven't already reached out to the attorney general, please do um, because I know that they are, are um, logging all of these complaints and investigating all of them. And my understanding is they've resolved quite a few. Some have been misunderstandings, others have not. Um, my hope is that in your situation that it's a misunderstanding and can be cleared up quickly. Thank you. And we looks like we've got Carrie back. So Carrie, we had a question um, that, that came through and uh, I wanted to repeat that one for you um, in hopes that you can kind of provide also your insight here. Uh, this is a question from John. John says that the uh, PPP is great, but if it is not extended at least 16 weeks to use it, special event businesses like caterers, venues, conference centers, wedding planners, et cetera, won't have enough business to use it with an eight week de deadline. Uh, is there anything being done to increase the amount of time for businesses like ours to use the PPP loan? Um, so I can't speak for our congressional partners, but I do know that this has been a topic of significant discussion um, within SBA. Um, we're not the, the writers of the law, but we're we're hearing this continually as businesses are saying, well, we can't open yet. Um, so the hospitality industry, particularly event planners, um, you know, you have a lead time of, you know, your bookings. And so this particular program, because it was intended to be a way to help you get back on your feet quicker by saving you costs of training and recruiting of your employees. Um, that's why the eight week uh, target. Now, when the legislation was passed, the expiration date of the PPP of June 30th, which meant that typically you could wait until June 28, 29 to get this loan. Um, and that would then shift that window to eight weeks after disbursement, which the disbursement could be June 30th. Um, because of the overwhelming demand for the program, um, the, the funds didn't last that long. And the second tranche of funding will probably also go quickly um, for those businesses who would have preferred to delay. In that case, um, there may be some opportunity to look at the idle program, um, as a potential source of revenue, but keep in mind that the program was specifically launched to be a replacement for self-employed or for unemployment insurance. Um, and so bringing back those employees, even before you have a full calendar of events is, is essential to get the full forgiveness. Um, if you are somebody who wants to bring back part of your employees and actually repay some of that loan, it is a 1% interest rate and it can be paid back over two years. 
Um, so it does still have a little more flexibility, but as far as pushing the eight weeks to 16 weeks, that is a matter for our congressional delegation. Thank you so much. Uh, our next question comes from John. And John asks, since businesses are starting to open up, will you work with the governor on opening up churches as well? Um, and I, this was actually directed for Representative Wallen. I think that this is the time when we really miss being with each other and faith-based communities are having to make real sacrifices by not having in-person um, fellowship. Um, I, I will apply the same formula to this question as others, and I really appreciate the question. And I also want to just ex take this moment to express my thanks and appreciation for the faith community and leadership roles in feeding people and looking after first responders and for all of your um, prayers and inspiration that you provide in our communities. Um, and that, but we need to have a plan. We need to show the governor that we can um, gather safely. So we all, I think we're pretty well educated at this point on what he is looking for. And that is social distancing and great hygiene and um, uh, personal protective equipment when, um, when we're in groups. Uh, I, I could have a lot, we could follow up offline about some ideas that I've had about <laughs> outdoor communion, you know, getting together out, out of doors. I think it's going to be very challenging though, because Sunday school was a great part of my growing up and separation of children is going to be a challenge. I mean, life may never be this quite the same. Um, and we're all being challenged right now to think about how we do things differently, but I will, I will definitely be willing to advocate for our uh, churches and religious organizations to be able to gather in person again. It's just, I would encourage you to think about ways that you can do it and present those to us and we will carry the torch with the governor. Thanks for everything you're doing. Great. Uh, our next question is from Randy. Randy wants, uh, would like to know, um, can you speak on the quest to acquire adequate supplies needed to fight this pandemic, uh, PPE, ventilators, and tests. Do we have a timeline yet on when antibody tests will be widely available? Uh, Representative Slatter, would you like to take that one? Sure, thank you. Thanks, Randy, for that question. We've obviously, we obviously want to make sure everybody's protected um, who is on the front lines, and then also as we open our economy. I mean, PPE is just becoming really important, and all of us have heard on the news that uh, there is a there is a shortage, you know, nationwide actually, and uh, people are trying to ramp up, and it's actually been the source of incredible innovation and creativity and community action by people sewing masks and uh, manufacturers retooling to provide um, face shields and masks and universities and different um, technology uh, people are you know engineers working to solve this problem, but. Frankly, we still have a shortage of PPE and your point is uh, very well taken. Uh, you know, at the moment, what we're hearing in terms of healthcare in our state, in our public health system, um, we are getting um, strategic um, stockpiles. Uh, you know, we're getting, uh, we're getting deliveries and, and uh, store, uh, giving uh, PPE delivered. Uh, and if you are needing it, if you're a healthcare entity, then you can request it from your emergency operations center uh, regionally and be able to get some. So our hospitals are, are finding that they're getting a little bit more regular um, delivery of PPE and they're doing okay. Uh, but we still have a pretty significant storage, um, a, a significant issue. And I think that that is, as um, Rep Wallen was talking about, will certainly impact um, you know, many more workers that could possibly, you know, be needing to use it. In fact, also our hospitals are also still affected with the lack of PEP, even though they might be okay at certain points right now, uh, because if they want to open elective procedures or they want to broaden their, um, 
their treatment of other patients, they will absolutely need more PPE as well. So we're still not out of the woods yet on PPE, but I do think that there's a lot of um, collaborative efforts and a lot of uh, scrutiny being placed on this because it's pretty vital that we have it. Uh, regarding antibody tests, um, you know, serological testing, or if you get COVID-19 and you develop an antibody to it, um, that is considered a good thing. It's considered an immunity to the, to the virus. Uh, and so a lot of people are talking about, could you test the antibody um, in people and know that they could go back to work, for example, or know that they might not be reinfected? Um, I think that that's something that a lot of people are looking at. And they're even looking at antibodies and people who have plasma that have had COVID and, and been um, treated and released as being ways that we could study for future treatment. The problem with antibody testing is that the science is still not clear. So if you are age 80 and you had COVID-19 and you recovered, is your immunity after that the same as someone who is 40? How long does that immunity last? Can you be reinfected? Should you, should you, be, um, should you be quarantined at a certain point? We are hearing reports of reinfection in other countries of but from what I've heard and read, so this is not a scientific view, but uh, is that uh, public health experts tend to sort of look at that and say, it could be that the test itself is saying it's positive when actually it's not, and we call those false positives. So right now, um, immunity is really important. Understanding it deeply is really important because you don't want to say someone's immune and they're actually not. So we're having to study that. And it's also going to be important as we, um, as we revive our economy. And so uh, it's, a, it's an important question. I don't think we have full answers yet. And uh, I think it's just very important to keep an eye on it. Thank you. Uh, we have another question uh, here uh, from Facebook chat. It's from Sam. Sam asks, when do the emergency powers of Governor Inslee expire? Specifically, when is the emergency over? And what legislative oversight is being done to ensure that this is not open-ended? And Senator Kudur, would you be interested in taking that question? Sure, thank you, uh, Travis. Well, um, the emergency isn't over. And so the governor is able to continue with his emergency powers uh, for the time being. Uh, there is right now ongoing uh, four corner um, all four corners of, of the legislature are in regular contact with the governor's office. Um, and so there's a lot of collaboration about what the governor does. Um, you know, oversight is clearly important. Uh, I think that is the role of the legislature. Uh, but I also think that this isn't the time for politics. I mean, the decisions that have been made by the governor have, he's been very clear that they're based on the science and the data and they have to continue to be. We are in um, a health crisis and uh, we need to be listening to the health experts uh, on where the data is so that we do make the best decisions possible for all citizens of the state. Thank you for the question. Great, thank you. Uh, and now this is a question, uh, and I tried to get more information, so uh, so make sure I get this right. But um, we have uh, from the Facebook chat, Mark. He uh, he says we need help with 501c4 homeowners associations. We have employees and are ineligible as it is now. We'd like an exception. And I'm not sure if this is in relation to the PPP or not. Carrie, are you able to speak to that? Um, I can. So Congress wrote the statute behind the PPP program. They intentionally were trying to limit the um, uh, eligibility to 501c3s and 501c19s, which are veteran organizations. Um, they've expanded it um, somewhat in the, the from the original um, uh, eligibility. And now, um, it's still limited, so the 501c4s are not eligible, but they are eligible for the EIDL program. So any nonprofit um, is eligible for the EIDL. And with our advance um, of $1,000 per in-person, 
um, forgiveness, if they have three employees, $3,000 of that would be forgivable. And HOAs are kind of uniquely situated in that um, they do have some, um, I would say, working capital needs. And whether it's to maintain irrigation systems, um, some of them have uh, community water systems, septic systems. Um, so they could also borrow from the EIDL program to help support some of those working capital needs, um, you know, to help maintain some of the common areas and stuff. So I would look at the EIDL, even though they're not eligible for PPP. Great, thank you. Uh, our next question is from Dwight. And Dwight asked uh, here in the Facebook chat, what do you all foresee for budget revenues and expenditures that may need to be adjusted due to the virus and the economy? I feel like maybe multiple people might want to speak to this one. Um, Representative Wallen, did you want to take a first crack? I know as you're a member of Finance Committee. I would. I think that we are going to see um, a pretty devastating revenue forecast come out in June. And they've been estimating anywhere from five to 10 billion, and I wouldn't be surprised if it's worse than that. Um, I think it's important to note that there are certain functions of the state government that we cannot cut, but I think that it would be unrealistic to expect zero cuts. Um, this might be an opportunity though, because this is a once in a lifetime event that we could look at our tax structure. And that is something that the finance committee is, is considering and thinking about. Um, for example, going away from a VNO tax to more of a corporate income tax structure or not, you know, decreasing our reliance on sales tax and property taxes and possibly considering a capital gains tax. It's a really tough time to talk about new revenue. Um, and I think that it's a really tough time to do anything to small businesses. I think that we've really learned that our economy and our employment depends on small businesses. And um, I am just, I will just share my concern that two or three months of, of, without activity, I think many of our businesses will uh, be okay, but four or five or six months, they'll close permanently. They're not just gonna pop back open, they're gonna be gone. So that's why the PPP program is so important and every, um, every one bit of these, every one of these programs is very important. Um, but long-term resilience, you know, economic recovery, it, we need to get creative. I think there's certain pieces of our economy that are, are, are being decimated and uh, we're seeing Boeing make huge adjustments. I don't know if the cruise industry will ever return. I mean, I could go on and on. So this might be a moment to pause and think about the restructure of our tax system to make it more fair and to increase the kind of economic activity that we want to have. I'm worried about us sliding into a depression and I know that the governor is worried about that as well because once those businesses do close for good, those employees will not have jobs to return to and then what happens. So, and the, the virus continues to evolve and surprise us. So I, I think we're just all in, an, in a, we're all human beings doing the best we can to uh, respond and think creatively, but also be very careful uh, not to hurt our citizens. So it's going to be a tough budget. It's going to be cuts and it's going to be serious revenue and it's going to be considered, you know, tapping our bond capacity and all kinds of ideas will be on the table. No need to be alarmed. Um, we're going to have a thorough conversation about that, but um, I, I think we've got some challenges ahead. Great, uh, and I, if no one else wants to take a, or respond to that, I can move on to the next question. Um, and this next question is actually for Senator Kuderer. Uh, and this, is, uh, this came in over the email, so um, I don't have a name here, but the question is, do you have an idea of how the closing of residential construction will impact the housing crisis we are in? Well, um, residential construction is just reopened as uh, Representative Wallen talked about earlier. So uh, that is good news. Uh, there are restrictions in place and how that will be um, uh, conducted so that uh, folks are safe and they can go home at night and not bring uh, COVID-19 back to those who live with them. Uh, and during that time too, there were some um, there were some public housing projects that had continued under similar restrictions. 
And uh, so in terms of the housing crisis, well, you know, we already know that we're down about 225,000 uh, residential units uh, over the last about 10, 10, 15 years or so that we're behind. We need those right now in order to meet current need. And I'm afraid that uh, COVID-19 is going to exacerbate the problem in terms of people not having a home. So we are looking at um, different approaches to uh, to how we address homelessness right now. Uh, I know in King County, uh, we were able to put people into uh, hotels and motels and they are using that as a pilot project to not just see if we can um, then rapidly rehouse people in permanent housing when this emergency passes uh, and the need isn't there for them to be in the hotel or motel, but also the effects on their physical and mental health. And they're already seeing benefits of that, which makes a lot of sense if you think about it logically. So I think what you're gonna find is that, and we heard this earlier um, from Representative Wallen, we have to kind of rethink some of our structures and our systems and how we addressed problems in the past. And what's, um, you know, what are the new creative ways that we can um, address some, some real foundational problems that we have. You know, we're very lucky in our state in the sense that, you know, we, we budgeted responsibly. Uh, we concluded session with um, uh, a, a, an ending fund balance and also with a very robust rainy day fund. Uh, we know that's not going to be enough to address the needs that we have from, from this illness. We know that we're going to need the help of the federal government. Um, but we are in a better spot to maybe make some of those structural changes that she was talking about. Um, and I do see that happening in housing as, as well and how we go about doing that. So it is going to put us a little behind, I think. Um, to, to the extent it really depends on how long this lasts and, and how we can ramp up and how creative we get on in terms of housing options for people. Thanks for the question. Great. Uh, we are getting kind of close to the end of time here, but I think we have time for a few more questions. Uh, the next one is from Mickey. Uh, Mickey just joined and, uh, and asked this question. So just joined and have a question on the SBA payroll loan. Waiting on Chase, told I was reviewed, and now nothing. Uh, waiting, he's waiting for funding and wants to know, is there anything more I can do? Carrie, is there, is there any, uh, anything else you would recommend to Mickey? Yeah, so um, first I just wanna ask if your credit report has been pulled. That's a good indication that your actual loan is in the process. Um, while we can't check every loan, um, because of the volume, there are certain loans where um, we've had some challenges where the, the lender has said, um, yeah, we're processing your loan. And then the applicants were kind of shut out of the first round of funding. Um, we can actually look in our SBA system to see if you at least made it far enough to get an SBA number. So this is really dangerous. Um, when I put this out in the public because I get just bombarded with phone calls. But if you try to reach your lender and you aren't able to get an SBA number, so ask them for your SBA number. If they can't give that to you, call my office. We'll look it up in the system. If we see you, then we know that you're good. Um, also, I want to highlight that <clears throat> we also brought on lenders um, that we traditionally don't do SBA lending because we recognize that there are some borrowers who maybe don't have traditional lending relationships or banking relationships. So Square, PayPal, um, Intuit, QuickBooks Lending, some of those FinTech lenders who maybe have a relationship with a business because of the point of sale that they use. Um, these lenders are participating. It's a pretty quick online application um, and the terms are the same regardless of where you go. Um, in Washington, our lending base has really been fantastic in comparison to some other states. We have 75 Washington-based lenders who have participated in this program. We have other lenders outside of the state and national lenders such as Chase, um, so we're really getting good lender coverage within our state. Great, thank you. 
Uh, I've got another question here, and this is from Greg. Uh, what is the protocol if the virus comes back after we reopen the economy? What will be done then? And uh, Representative Slatter, I wonder if you'd like to take that question. Well, I um, thank you for the question. I think that that's a question people are thinking about, right? Because we worry about um, if we open too quickly that there would be another spike in, in the virus. And then, you know, the sort of this process of sort of mitigating and making everyone shelter in place and then a spike and then another, another um, shelter in place and then a, another spike is not really the pattern that people really want. Um, there is a thought that because of the fall season that typically viruses like this, like the flu, do come back in, in, at that time of year. So it's not a, it's a really valid concern. Uh, I think that the way I understand it is that the governor wants to open in phases and with testing and with contact tracing so that we actually can prevent having another spike. Um, because I do think that if you do have another spike, then you have to, we have, we'll have to go through this again, where we'll have to make sure people shelter in place and that they don't, um, you know, that they don't meet with many people and that gatherings are, are lessened, et cetera. And so, um, you know, this, this virus, defeating this virus is what we need to do to um, revive our economy. Because, you know, I, I, I know this is a metaphor, but you know, people that are going on ventilators with COVID-19, we are also putting our economy on life support. And with, um, with the resurgence of this virus, you are going to have um, a similar impact and possibly even a worse impact if people are just now, just recovering and then having to go through, uh, through another um, shelter in place order again. So um, I think that what's really important is to stay the course right now to, um, to follow the guidelines uh, that the governor's put out based on the science and the data, to be careful about who you're in contact with. I know you've heard it many times, you know, wash your hands. It's really important. It's one of the single most effective things you can do. Of course, the social distancing, the sheltering in place and being really careful in crowds of people, if you're in people that are not actually following those guidelines to wear a mask. And it just sounds so simple, um, and it doesn't sound like it could make that big a difference sometimes, but it really, really does. And it would prevent, uh, I think it could prevent a second peak. And particularly, we live in a state where um, we are watching those numbers, and we are watching that data, and we can get that information out to people as soon as possible. So um, if you are paying attention, and thank you so much for those of you, everyone's making sacrifices. Some you know, are really, truly, um, it's impacting their entire livelihood. And it's, it's, it bothers us, I know, uh, as we hear these stories and we really want people to get back to the, what our normal life activities were. Um, this is a highly transmissible, lethal virus. And uh, make no mistake, it is something that we haven't seen before. We've seen highly transmissible viruses and we've seen lethal viruses. You can think of Ebola or H1N1 but this has got both. And um, our, ask our first responders, ask people whose family members have been um, affected. Um, it is significant. And uh, so I agree that um, we don't want to have a second spike. And if we do, returning, um, you know, returning, we'll do it because we're, people are great and our community is great and we would be able to figure that out. But I don't think we want to get there if we can't, if we don't have to. I hope that helped <laughs> answer your question. Well, thank you. And <laughs> unfortunately, we are about out of time, and that was our last question. But if your question wasn't answered, please email your lawmakers, and their offices will get back to you. Their email addresses will be on the screen when this event concludes. Uh, thank you to everyone who participated in our virtual town hall, and a big thank you to Carrie Hurd from the Small Business Administration for joining us tonight. I'm now going to turn it back over to the legislators for closing remarks. And Senator Kuduro, would you like to go first? Sure, thank you. And thank you again to everyone who shared your time with us. Um, very appreciative that you took time to tune in. Um, you know, these are really, really challenging times as Representative Slaughter was referring to. And um, you know, the, the good news is we will come through this. We will get through this together. Uh, and, and I believe that we'll be stronger. And I am so proud 
um, and grateful to Washingtonians for how they have responded to this so far. Uh, and it is because of that response, it's because of that uh, respect for their fellow community uh, member that we have seen um, the, the curb go in the direction it needs to go. We know we have more work to do, but we've never been afraid of hard work in this state. And there's more to come. And I just want to tell you that it's, it's an honor to serve as your state senator. And my office is open to assist you. So if you have any questions or concerns, please email or call. Uh, and we will um, get back to you with, with answers for you to the best of our knowledge. We know that this is an, uh, an ongoing and evolving uh, situation, uh, but we'll give you the best information that we have. Thank you again. Thank you, and uh, Representative Slatter. Thank you, Travis. Um, thank you, everyone, for being um, here with us on this call, for asking questions, for being engaged. Um, Carrie, it's been great to have you also uh, with us <laughs> uh, to answer those really complex questions, and I learned a lot as well. Um, I just want to say that um, you know I, I think that uh, Senator Cooter said it so eloquently. You know that um, as a community, as a Washingtonians, I mean, if you're a parent who's working from home and also teaching your kids, homeschooling them, if you're somebody who's had to shutter their business. If you're somebody who knew someone or had a family member in life care center or long-term care facility, if you yourself have been tested positive and are at home dealing with the virus, it doesn't matter who you are. Um, we are thinking about you. We hear you and we see you and we want to help. And so let us know when you have questions or concerns so we can help you in any way possible. Um, we are all in this together and we will uh, overcome this. I truly believe that as well as we have so many other um, aspects and, and challenges in our lives and our community. I can't be more proud as well to be uh, your state representative and to do what we can to um, provide the resources that you need. Thank you for being on the call and please keep in touch and let us know how you're doing and wash your hands. And Representative Wallen. Thank you, Travis. And I want to thank Carrie also for that really good information. Um, this is a challenging time. It's a frightening time. I think there is a lot of anxiety kind of running through our communities and we're definitely feeling it and we're hearing it in your emails and outreach to our offices. Um, we are doing our very best to represent you. It is absolutely a privilege to be your state representative, especially trusting us with this huge responsibility of this sort of once in a lifetime uh, epidemic. Um, I'm also very proud of our communities getting creative, helping each other, feeding each other, taking care of each other's kids, um, being really responsible. And I think this is a moment of pause. We're seeing how we can work from home. We can reduce the number of cars on the streets. We can um, fund something that's really called an emergency when we treat it like an emergency we really can attack a problem and i'm proud of us for attacking this problem in this way um and i i hope that we apply the same uh gusto to some of the other challenges that we face in our communities um i want to thank everyone for being with us and for all of your support and um Please know that my family cares about you and all of your representatives and my office, um, my legislative assistant and these ladies legislative assistants are um, working really hard to try to answer some difficult questions and we just are a team and we um, are working for you. So thank you for the privilege and please do take, please do reach out to us and let us know how we can help you. Thank you, Travis. Thanks, Carrie. Thanks, Senator. Thanks, Representative. And Carrie, did you have any final remarks you wanted to make? Any last minute bits of advice? Um, well, I'll just, since you gave me the opportunity, um, I just want to put out a couple of quick things. I don't know how many individuals on this call may have applied for the idle um, in the very beginning and got an application number of a two. Um, if you have a two and you have not reapplied, 
uh, please reach out to my office as soon as possible. If you have an application number that starts with a three, you are fine. Um, you don't need to contact me. Um, and then I also want to say for our self-employed individuals, um, there's an employee retention tax credit that will help you offset some of the cost of your wages. Um, and that tax credit is available on the IRS site, um, coronavirus. If you get a PPP loan, you're not eligible for the tax credit, but it is a way to also help um, offset some of those wages as you're trying to recover. For self-employed 1099 type workers, the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Insurance um, is an expansion of the regular unemployment. And you may be eligible for that, even though you might not be eligible for the regular unemployment compensation. So I would encourage you to look at Washington's Employee Security uh, Department site. And then in last, um, I encourage everybody to check out the sba.gov site. We have lots of information and uh, subscribe to sba.gov backslash updates so that you'll get announcements from SBA and training. Um, we have it all posted on our website. Again, it's valuable it's pro bono. And then the state of Washington has a really great site for businesses. That's business w.gov. And they've done a great job of not only posting federal, state, but even some local information for local grants and maybe some um, charity grants that have come in to help businesses. So again, I just want to thank you. Um, it's an honor to serve small businesses in Washington. And um, I wish you all the best personally and professionally. Thank you. Thank you. And again, if you do have questions that weren't answered and you want to email your lawmakers, go ahead and just keep watching the stream and the screen will come up with their email addresses. And that we can say goodnight. Thank you all so much. Thank you.